Good afternoon, all of you. So we'll continue the hearing of witness, and now with uh, the second witness on torture, and I call Eran Dogan. So just to remind you, as all the witnesses have 20 minutes to present your testimony and then the question time by the judges. You have the floor, Mr. Dogan. Distinguished presidents, dear members of the tribunal. My name is Arhan Doğan. I used to work as a teacher of history in Turkey in Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey. When the so-called coup attempt on the 15th of July happened, I was working there as a teacher at a school belonging to the Gülen group. I was also an administrator at the school. So when the incident of 15 July happened, I was residing in Ankara. I was in that city at that time. One week after that event, uh, a lot of arrests started to happen, and the schools that were close to the Gudang group were pillaged by the people. They were burned down, destroyed. Of course, we were very anxious and nervous. But I haven't received any decisions for arrest or detention in my name. And 10 days later, a teacher at, at our school and two friends of this teacher called me. They said, the policemen are here. They're asking about you. Can you please come? And I went to the school immediately. And after I went to the school, we have a floor which we call the administrative floor. It's on the first floor. While I was going up the stairs, I had gone two or three steps, and then I saw really huge uh, people who had beards. They were waiting for me at the stairs. When I was about to approach them, they called out to me, are you Arhan Doan? I said, yes, that's me. And then they held me from my collar, and they pushed me to the wall, and I hit the wall while I was trying to answer to them, who are you, what are you doing to me? And then I, I asked them, do you have any uh, decisions to search the school? They uttered uh, insults, and they called me a terrorist, and they started to better me and beat me up. There were four of these people. Then they took me to a classroom. And then uh, the other employees of our school were also taken to a different classroom. Then they came to me. They approached me. Three of them started to beat me. And then they told me, if you don't accept what we tell you to do, if you don't obey our commands, your whole life will turn into, turn into a misery, including your family. If you do what we tell you, now we are going to release you. That's what they told me. I said, what do you want from me? Then they told me to tell them who I'm having meetings with, who I discuss with, who are the senior officials of the Gulen organization in Ankara. Give us 10 names. If you give us these 10 names, we are going to release you from this building, they told me. And then they told me, we want you to accept that you are a member of a terrorist organization. We want you to accept this indictment and we want you to sign a document and then i said i've never been involved in any acts of terrorism i'm 40 years old i told them and so far i've never been involved in a crime i haven't even been called to the police station to provide a testimony i'm never ever a terrorist and i can never give you any names i don't know anyone i'm just an administrator here and i just discussed with the teachers here and i'm trying to administer this place and they told me okay it looks like you're not going to have your wits about you. OK, it's your choice, they told me. After that, that plain clothes uh, policeman, about three or four people, of course, they didn't show me any identity. They didn't let me show. Uh, they didn't let me ask any questions. Of course, they tortured us for a while. Then a second team came after they left. A second team came uh, to the school. They also started to beat us. And we never accepted their accusations. I told them, I'm never, ever, I cannot be a terrorist. I never accept your accusations, I told them. Then they also left at around 12 p.m. at night. Uh, official policeman from Ankara Tem 
uh, which is the police department, head police department in Ankara. They came to our school and they seized our computers. They also took away our smart boards in the classrooms. They kept us at the school until the morning. We told them we want to meet some people can be called our lawyers, but they took away our phones. They told us you cannot contact anyone. And then in the morning, they separated us. So each of us was put in a separate car and we were escorted by two policemen in each car. They took us to Ankara Tam, which is the Ankara anti-terrorism police station. So of course, also within the police car, they also continue to exert violence towards us. When we reached Ankara Tam, the anti-terrorism police station in Ankara, we saw that we were also escorted by around 12 policemen. And when we entered Ankara Tam, there was an empty corridor and we saw a plain clothes uh, policeman and then they told us that the official policeman should go away. And then we were alone there. Then they started to shout at us. They insulted us. They called us dogs, uh, dishonorable men, etc. And then they asked us to be brought. So the policeman created a corridor and we, we had to go through that corridor. They battered us down and they, they took us to that chief individual and they had us lined up along the wall. They asked me, who is the administrator or the headmaster of the school? I said, that's me. And then we also saw that there were other intern uh, teachers of our school there. They separated me from them. They took me inside the building to a dark corridor. Uh, three people there also physically ex exerted physical violence towards me. They told me, this is our last warning. If you don't abide by our commands, this is going to be your last station. You might die here. There are people who died here and nobody knows about them. So this is how they threatened me. And then I said, okay, you can exert violence towards me, but I never thought about the possibility of dying. It never even crossed my mind. Up until then, it never even crossed my mind that I might lose my life there. Then they brought me to a gym, a gym hall. It's about twice the size of this current conference hall. When we entered inside, all around the hall, there were people wearing orange overalls. So it was a uniform clothes. They all had handcuffs and then they were sitting along the edge of the walls. So when I saw them, I began to think about Guantanamo prison. And I began to think about the prisoners there who were wearing those orange orals. And of course, that was a psychological collapse for me. I started to think, okay, this might be the beginning of very bad things for us. Then they handcuffed us behind, behind our back and they asked us to sit next to the wall. Of course, you get tired when you fall onto the floor, they lift you up and they ask you to sit uh, with your hands behind you and you have to recline against the wall. So now and then they were calling some names. There was a continuous circulation. There were people coming in, going out. And then I looked around me, all around the wall. There was, there was blood, so up to a certain level at the same size of a, of a human length. And this was proof that they tortured people. And I saw that, I, I actually learned later on that the soldiers who were arrested after the 15th of July were taken there. There they were tortured, they were interrogated. And I saw there were traces of blood all around the walls. And when I saw that, of course, I became even more frightened. They gave us every day a small piece of bread and a small piece of a box of jam and also uh, this much water, like a small bottle of water, like I just showed you. And then in the evening of the first day, at around 7 or 8 p.m., they read out my name. They took me away. And also within the building, they took me to another place where I had to go through several corridors. And there, there were again four plain clothes uh, officers. They again physically exerted violence against me. They hit my head on the walls. So they surrounded me in front of me, behind me, on my both sides. 
they encircled me. Then they kept asking me questions. Did you get married by means of the congregation? Who do you know in the grand group? Who are the high level senior officials in the grand group? Give us 10 names. They insistently tried to impose on us that this is a terrorist organization. And they asked us to sign some documents. Of course, I'd been thinking because I'd been in that structure for 20 years and we have never been engaged or I've never seen any acts of violence that could be termed as an act of terrorism. I've also never been involved in a terrorism, of course. Calling these people terrorists would definitely injure my conscience. And I said, this is not in compliance with my honor, feelings of honor, so I was not able to accept that. So 10 days we were tortured, then they brought us back uh, to the hall. Of course, they kept reading out the names so I don't know what the professions of the other uh, people were. Sometimes they kept saying, now the scholars from Gaza University come here. Uh, and then I understood that those were the scholars from that university. Sometimes they were calling out their names. Sometimes people were saying, I have diabetes. I need to have my medication. Uh, this food is, is harmful to me. Even though they said that they were never heard and all their demands were dismissed. And so uh, for four days, this uh, torture continued. And after a certain period, around 11 or 12 p.m. at night, uh, some people used to come to our room and they would disappear at around 4 or 5 a.m. These were really strange types, uh, I could call them. I saw them there for the first time. They used to come at night and they would disappear uh, in the morning. I only saw them in those periods. So that was the uh, heaviest form of torture. When they took us away on those nights, for example, I apologize uh, to my colleagues here and friends. They would undress us. Then they would pour cold water onto us. They would spray cold water on us. And then they were using this bludgeons to, to beat us. This is how I was tortured in the, on the first night. And the second night, they use this Palestine hanger. Uh, so they tie you with your hands behind you, and then they leave you up hanging from the ceiling. This is what I was subjected to. And this uh, Palestinian hang, or this form of torture, I believe they kept me there for about one or two hours. When they released me from that, I thought all my bones in my body were broken. That's how I thought. I wasn't able to walk. There were two policemen that escorted me after this torture of Palestinian hunger, which is also called strapado. Uh, so there were also doctors, two or three doctors, in a field, in a, in a space of around uh, five square meters. There were people who were dressed as in doctor's clothes. The policemen took me there. They made me enter through the door. We were waiting there at the door. The doctor was ahead of us. The first time I went there, the doctor asked me, are you okay? I said, don't you see? I just couldn't help it because it's clear that I was tortured. And I told him, don't you see how I am? And then the doctor, it was a young female doctor. She bowed her head down. She was a young doctor. I could never forget her face. Then the policeman said, doctor, just wait. We will come again. They took me again, they tortured me again. And this time the policeman told me, when the doctor asks you, you should not speak. We are going to speak then. Otherwise, we are going to come back to you again, they told me. Then we went there again. This time the doctor asked me, are you OK? Uh, she asked me, and the, doc uh, the policeman said, no, he is all fine. Then they, they took me back to the gym. It was one day before the arrest. They took me away again at night. So the places where they tortured us, there was a corridor, there were also some divisions. So there were some slots which were open in the front, but you could hear the people next. It was like cubicles because they were torturing people in the adjacent cubicles. When they took me there, 
when they started to torture me, because uh, we didn't have any door in front of us, I could see three ladies uh, walking in front of us. Then the ladies were brought to the section uh, next to us, in this sort of like a cubicle, which is like a space with, without a door. Of course, I could hear the screams of those ladies. It was so harrowing, it was very scary for me. And they told us, they were begging them, please don't rape us. This is what the ladies were telling them. Well, hi, Krishna. I can still hear their screams. It's still resonating in my mind. Then they threatened me. They told me, if you don't do what we want you to do, we know. We know about you, they told me. We know you have a wife, you have a daughter. They might end up the same, like these ladies. So. Of course, that night for me was the most difficult night in my life. After that, the next day, I decided to commit suicide. I decided to kill myself. I was just thinking of how I could do it. They would take us outside for toilet uh, needs, uh, and I was thinking, to myself, maybe I could do something there in that period in the toilet break. Then I asked for permission to go to the toilet. However, because of my religious belief, I know it's very heavy. It's a very heavy sin to commit suicide. I know it's a very serious sin, so of course, then I sincerely prayed and I said, please. So I had one day to think, then I was taken to court. When I was taken to court, I started to feel happy. I said, okay, finally, this is maybe the light at the end of the tunnel for me. That's how I started to, to feel. I hope, God willing, we will be arrested. I hope we will be taken to prison. That was what I was thinking about. Of course, we were taken to court. As my friend just talked about, the policeman who tortured us came into the court hall along with us. The judge didn't even look at us in the face. He never asked us anything. He said, your testimony was heard at the police station. Are you going to add anything to that? Okay, no, then we decide on your arrest. Then they arrested us. Then we were taken to the aggravated uh, crime prison in Sinjan. And when I was going to the prison, I was actually happy. I said, oh, thanks God, I'm being taken to prison. So we entered the prison. They did all the procedures. So afterwards, they took us to an empty room, which was as big as this. And But there were all soldiers around 20 years old, very young soldiers. They were all battered. Their clothes were torn. They t they had taken to us there in orange overalls. Of course, when they saw us in orange overalls, they told to the soldiers, these are PETA members, the terrorist organization members. Of course, the soldiers said, okay, this is why, the, it's because of these people that we have been tortured and they started to see us very, in a bad angle and of course I started to worry okay is this is this the prison then are we going to be in such a crowded location but then they took us to a ward uh, because that room was a temporary stay then they took us to wards when I entered the ward the prison ward I saw that there were people who were captured uh, based on 
uh, allegations of being a member of the Gulen movement. So we were about 50 people in the ward. Uh, the prison conditions were very heavy because they had brought extra limitations, as I said, in a place, in a ward of uh, normally 16 people, we were staying with 50 people. And people had to wait for 40 minutes in order to go to toilet. They were giving hot water only two and a half hours, once a week. So uh, you would only have one or two minutes. So we were taking the hot water in buckets, and this is how we were trying to groom ourselves. And the hygienic conditions were very poor. The attitudes of the guardians was very offensive. They constant, constantly insulted us. They never answered any of our requests. And of course, in the society, these people were constantly motivated against you because they saw us as terrorists that had to be destroyed. These people were in such psychology, and they were coming to prison with the psychology, trying to govern us there or trying to rule over us. So in the morning session, they talked about the prison controls. So I'd like to give you some personal anecdotes. So we talked about Europe and human rights. So they said there would be uh, a delegation coming from the uh, yeah, European Human Rights Committee. So they told us beforehand that this delegation would come to prison to inspect, and they would ask you some questions. And then they told us, if you say anything, uh, apart from what we told you, what we, what we gave you as a script, to, then you won't be able to see our family. Uh, because in about, uh, they, they, they would prevent us from meeting with our, from seeing our families, or they would even put us in solitary confinement. So three days later, this delegation came to our ward, but nobody was able to say anything, because normally we were only allowed to see our family once every two months, and they would even take this right away from us. We had the chance to talk to our children only 10 minutes, and they would even take this away from us. Also, the solitary confinement was very heavy. The guardians would take people away from the ward. Uh, they would uh, take you away. They would beat you. And then they would put you in solitary confinement. So these prison conditions were very heavy. It was really a much above the capacity. And of course, if you're a political prisoner, they really turn your life into misery. You don't want to live anymore. In a way, it's like being imprisoned to death, so to speak. Therefore, this is all I can say about the prison conditions. Also, I would like to tell you the following. So when we were in prison, uh, we constantly heard uh, the statement from Tayyip Perdon, who was saying, even if these people are released from prison, our people will spit them in their face. They will give them what they deserve. They will turn their life into hell. Uh, this was what Erdogan was all the time saying uh, in the squares. So even if you leave, you come out of the prison, your life still doesn't change. You still live, in, live through hell. And I'm going to tell you my experience. So after this so-called coup attempt, they started to have this uh, application, which we call decree in the force of law uh, practice. So the head of the state was issuing these decrees in the force of law. So one of the decisions is very interesting. The people who exerted torture or who were involved in such events, even if they are civilian, they would be protected under law. Uh, this article one to one of the decree in the force of law number 696. So uh, this is actually a license to kill. Uh, this was a serious source of motivation for such people, for the people in the society who were provoked against uh, us. So I was actually arrest, kept uh, under arrest for 10 months without an indictment. I never heard what the crimes uh, ascribed to me were only 10 months later we had an indictment and the indictment said that you worked in the schools belonging to Gilan group secondly you were a member of a trade union third you had an account at bank asia for you use an application called bylock i asked the judge dear esteemed judge who gave uh, the permission to open these Gilan schools it was the 
Republic of Turkey. When I was working in those schools, I applied the Ministry of Education of Turkey. The Ministry of Education of Turkey gave me the approval to work in those schools. So the state opened those schools, no problem. The Ministry of National Education gave me the permission to work there, no problem. But just because I worked there, they called me. So I told about this to the judge at the court. Of course, the, ju the attitude of the judge gave me the opinion that there wouldn't be a fair trial. I already had formed that opinion there. And then and I stayed in prison for 18 months. And they condemned me to six year, to seven years, six months. And then I was released by the higher court with the judicial control. So I had to go to the police station once every two weeks and I had to sign a paper there. So after I was released from the prison, when I was back into the society again, I could see the attitude in the society. They were really isolating, they were really authorizing and they were really insulting me. It was even more aggravated for me than the environment in prison because even my closest relatives, my blood relatives, my siblings, my own aunt, uncle, uh, my nearest uh, relatives saw me as a terrorist, but they knew that I was not a terrorist, but they were motivated by the Turkish government because 30 national and 200 local media outlets always pumped these news. So those people took this discourse, they ingested this discourse as if it's true. And then I decided that I could no longer reside and live in Turkey. Because when I was in prison, my family, my wife, my children had gone through a serious psychological trauma because of this isolating pressure of the society. The government didn't even give them social aids. They said, because your husband is arrested, they didn't even have social security. Thank you very much for your testimony, very important. And now I will ask the judge if they have any question. Uh, to put to you, and I will start with uh, Judge uh, Pache. I, uh, I actually have several questions, but I'll, I'll try to stick to one. Um, your, uh, and you, you said that you were sentenced sometime in, uh, uh, well, you were sentenced, uh, when were you sentenced? And uh, uh, you were arrested, you were t picked up on the, uh, just after the attempted coup, uh, and you were uh, actually on 27, 25 July, and then you were taken and, and uh, treated the way you described. And uh, finally, you uh, went to trial, um, uh, I don't know exactly when, but you were sentenced to seven years and six months. Th that's correct, isn't it? Yes, yes that's correct. Okay. And uh, how much of those seven years did you serve? So after I was arrested, I was in prison for 18 months, four times. I was taken to court on the fourth hearing. 30 January 2018, I was uh, sentenced to seven years, six months uh, at the aggravated penal court. And then we had to recourse uh, to the administrative court of the region. We used this right. And then I was released uh, with the condition of a judicial control. But after I was released, I saw that I could no longer live in Turkey. Then I went abroad. I, I escaped. I escaped. Appeal. You were released on appeal. You appealed successfully. January 2018, and then you went to appeal, and and then the, uh, as as I understand it, the appeals uh, instance, whether it was a court or a board, I don't know, uh, somehow decided that you should be released. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, and then after I was released from prison. But afterwards, the, sorry, he's just talking. Oh, 
30 Ocak 2018. 30 January 2018. Evet. Yes, I was. Yeah, yes, it's the same court. So 18th uh, aggravated crime court. And this was the fourth hearing. This, I was taken to the court for the fourth time. When I went to the 18th aggravated criminal court, they ruled uh, that uh, I would be subjected to seven years, six months of prison because of being a, a member of a criminal or a terrorist organization. But then I had a chance to have a recourse to a higher court. And then afterwards, at the time of waiting for the decision of the higher courts, uh, they released me uh, on the condition of judicial control, but I was convinced that this higher court would also approve uh, this this uh, sentence of seven years, six months. And of course, as I expected, this higher court, this regional court also approved the sentence of seven years, six months. And now my case is at the court of cassation. So the seven years, six months was... Uh. Yes, uh, right now it's at the court of cassation, but then I escaped in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Ben teşekkür ederim. Justice Bey's I will I would like to thank you. Now I will give you the floor to Justice Bey and if you have any question. Thank you. I would like to ask you in your own assessment what has been the impact of of what you've gone through in you and your family and as I understand you and as you stated you have escaped the country. What what would you describe is, is the impact uh, now, even after you, you're outside of Turkey? Thank you. Well, this torture, after this torture I had in Turkey and after what I suffered uh, from in prison, I was deeply disappointed about Turkey. After I was released from prison, Apart from one older brother, all my relatives, all other my relatives turned their backs against me. So because of the trouble of my family, I saw that my children also were uh, psychologically suffering from this condition. So I decided that I was to leave Turkey. This was an emotional uh, point of break uh, from Turkey for me. So uh, I crossed the river Meriç with only one backpack the river Maritsa, that's between Greece and Turkey. So we had some options as we escaped. We would either be arrested by the Turkish soldiers or our boat would be sunk or we would escape and go to the other side. And I was willing to have these two alternatives apart from being arrested by the Turkish soldiers. I would either um, escape, go to the other side, or I hoped the other alternative would be that our boat would sink. I never wanted to be arrest a court by the Turkish soldiers because I would never be able to go through the same situation again. My family and I uh, when have come to Germany now. Our application of asylum has been completed. My children are there. They are attending school, but they still are suffering psychologically. I also still dream about torture when I sleep at night. But I think that it, overall it was a good decision for us to come here and slowly we are recovering from these events. Now I'm trying to learn language, uh, learn the language, and I want to become a social pedagogist in the future. I would especially like to help people who had to seek asylum, like me. That's what I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justice Van der <coughs> Thank you, President. Um, Mr. Dogan, I have two very short questions. The first one is you've described several things that happened to you. And the previous question was about the impact. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the impact specifically of the threat to rape your wife in the way that you heard the other women screaming and begging, etc.? What was the, I know one cannot separate it, but compared to the beating and all the other things, um, what was the impact of that specific threat? Small question. Yeah. So, 
So actually, for me, that was the heaviest experience for me. As I said, this was when I felt my whole world collapse around me. It had such a deep impact on me, I wanted to end my life because when I saw how those people being tortured and I even heard it live next to me and I said, okay, maybe this is not such a distant possibility. This could also be my wife. So that thought really affected me deeply. And I'm, like I said, I still hear those screams when I sleep at night. You, you were a bit emotional and that of course is entirely understandable. Um, the Turkish government is not here participating in this tribunal. If they were here, they would have had lawyers who would ask you many questions to test your evidence. They would cross-examine you. Um, you would have um, been tested in many ways. So what all I'm asking you is, if uh, would you be willing to say exactly the same if you gave evidence under oath, if you could actually be s receive a prison sentence for lying here in Switzerland, or, or for exaggerating, if you were asking, if you were asked questions, would your evidence be exactly the same, or would you tone it down, or would you change it, or do you stand by every single thing you said? <coughs> I'm 40 years old, and this is going to be one of the important points of struggle for me in my future. Uh, I think that these people who tortured me or other people, they sh shouldn't get away with those. I wish they were here with me, in front of me. I wish those torturers or the people who gave them these orders were standing in front of me and I could shout out these facts in their face. And that's the reason why I wanted to be here, actually. As we have this event here, and when we go home and we sleep, there are still people who are suffering torture in Turkey, who die because of torture in Turkey. I can never defend this. So of course, I'm going to always stand behind my words. I look forward to that day. I hope one day the authorities of the Turkish government will be here in front of me. I hope I will one day be given that chance. I hope there will be independent courts. There will be fair trials. But I would also like to mention that torture in Turkey is not a new phenomenon. For many years, Kurds, Alawites were subjected to torture. And unfortunately, in Turkey, there have never been any concrete sentences against the people who tortured others. So my fear is that the torturers in this recent period will also get away with their crimes. I hope this won't be the case. I hope they will deserve, they will have their deserved punishment I hope they will not uh, exert the same torture or violence 10 years later on another group. This is my only wish. So of course we are being threatened on social media, our family is being threatened. Of course there is a risk, even though we are in Europe. In Germany, for example, Erkan Ajayar, a journalist, he was beaten up in his house. Also another boxer, uh, because he's an opponent of the government of Turkey, he was lynched in the street. Of course such things can happen. But as you mentioned at the beginning of this tribunal, I think being silenced means that you are not an honorable person. Therefore, no matter what it costs, we need to raise our voice. Okay, thank you very much. I was just told that uh, Mrs. Keshkin may have to leave the room earlier because she has to attend a court hearing. One of her clients tried to hang himself this morning. So if you don't mind, I do prefer to stop now your testimony and to start immediately with the testimony of uh, Mrs. Keshkin. Could you be kind enough as to be at the disposal of the tribunal after the testimony of Mrs. Keshkin? You don't mind if it's possible for you? Yes, that's okay for me. Şimdi biliyorum Sayın Keskin'in de Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. If you would like, uh, as you wish, I can continue later. If you have further questions, of course, I am able to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you much for your kindness. So we have to adjust uh, to that. You have your question, and you? 
Thank you, Madam President. I have a question. You're saying that you crossed over from Turkey to Greece. Then uh, when you crossed over to Greece, did you ask for asylum in Greece? How did it happen that you obtained asylum protection in Germany? And how did you kind of move from Greece to, to Germany? Uh, So I went to Greece from Turkey, and once I was in Greece, we had to walk for three or four hours. And while we were walking, the police came across us, and they took us to a, a custodial place. They took us under custody. So. And here I had an interesting experience. A civilian came and listened to what had happened to us. And I told him what happened to me in Turkey. And he said, there are many, they, uh, he asked me whether the people who came at around 11 o'clock at night and disappeared towards, towards 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, he asked me whether they was, were a member of the Sadat group. Maybe you've heard of the Sadat. This is a, 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 not a very secret, but a paramilitary Turkish group. And I told this person, I didn't know. I didn't know who they were. But it's possible. So once we were caught in Greece, they took our fingerprints in the United Nations camp. And then they, they allowed us to make an appeal for refugee status. But I didn't want to stay in Greece because I thought that Greece wouldn't be safe for me. Because Meet, the Turkish intelligence uh, service, is able to move freely in Greece, from what I believe. And I read that the meat had already done some things in Greece, so I had to find somewhere safer than Greece. And there are people in Greece who help people like me. So I met with them, and I went to Gre uh, Germany thanks to them. Once I arrived in Germany, I, I had documents with me uh, explaining, proving that I had been arrested and so on. And so I presented these documents. And the person who interviewed me in Germany said that the the accusation made against me was absurd, that the indictment against me was absurd. And so I gave them these documents. I told them about my situation. Everything that I told you today, I told them in Germany. And they accepted to give me a refugee status. And later on, I was able to bring my wife and children to Germany. They arrived, and now we're all together struggling to recreate our lives. After age 40, of course, it's a bit dif difficult to adapt to a new culture, a new country, a new life. It's not easy for us, but we're very happy to have been able to escape from Turkey. Thank you very much. Any other question from the judges? Maybe I have a question for you. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too theoretical, but what you have, were suffering uh, in jail, of all you explained to us, the act of beating uh, Palestinian angers and so on. For you, is it degrading, inhuman, torture treatment? And uh, maybe if you can explain to us, uh, if you want to, if you doesn't want, I don't want to insist, but could you explain to us uh, which kind of act of torture or degrading inhuman treatment did you suffer? Except from Palestinian angers, beating, uh, threatening, threatening your wife, or which uh, all of waterboarding, all this torture act that we are aware. But I don't want to insist if you don't want to uh, revisit this uh, very painful souvenir. Uh, Actually, each time I repeat these, it's as if I were living through them all over again. It's really very painful for me. But at the same time, I believe that these need to be heard. And I, so I want to tell you about them. Until the age of 40, I'd never even been insulted in my life. So even those, the slightest of insults was dishonoring for me. The, the fact I, I was stripped, that was also terrible for me. And then four or five people beating me. It was a terrible experience. And then, and then pe people touched my most private parts. 
this is just the worst that can happen. But the most dishonorable thing for me was to hear the cries of those ladies that I told you about. That's what affected me the worst. Yes, apart from this, yes, I was beaten. But up to a, mo up to a point, you can understand that because these people are motivated in different ways. They're not, their psychology is not normal. Where we were staying, the windows were broken. There were bullets everywhere. And they were blaming us. They were saying that we were the ones who'd shot those pistols there, that we were the ones who'd killed their friends, that who'd bombed their houses. Of course, so they had this certain absurd, surreal motivation. And with that motivation, they were capable of anything. Everything that I went through in that jail was was very damaging to my psychology. It's been five years since I've lived through all that. But for me, it's all as if it were yesterday. If I were to see today the person who tortured me, I, I would still remember them. I will never forget their faces. I'll never forget the face of that doctor. And I hope that I'll be able to see them one day. I really hope one day I'll be able to come face to face with the people who tortured me and that I'll be able to scream in their faces what they did to me because I've truly been dishonored. It was the worst treatment ever. Thank you very much, very much for uh, being with us this afternoon and giving your testimony.